gay marriage, science, and political correctness. There's some gay marriage research that was done just published just uh, in December of last year. It was by uh, Michael Lacour and uh, uh, Dr. Green, who um, uh, wrote a paper that got into science. When Contact Changes Minds, an Experiment on Transmission of Support for Gay Equality. Uh, you can get it on the web, although it will cost you to get the whole thing. Unless you have a subscription to science or your institution does. And the, this has not only a, an abstract by the uh, authors, but it also has what they call an editor summary. And uh, it's called Dialogue Opens the Door to Attitude Change. Personal contact between in-groups and out-group individuals of equivalent status can, be, can reduce perceived differences and thus improve intergroup relations. Uh, LaCour and Green demonstrate that simply a 20-minute conversation with a gay canvasser produced a large and sustained shift in attitudes towards same-sex marriage for Los Angeles County residents. Surveys showed persistent change up to nine months after the initial conversation. Indeed, the magnitude of the shift for the person who answered the door was as large as the difference between attitudes in Georgia and Massachusetts. Can a single conversation change minds on, uh, this is now the abstract itself, can a single conversation change minds on divisive social issues such as same-sex marriage? Randomized placebo-controlled trial assessed whether gay or straight Messengers were effective at encouraging voters to support same-sex marriage and whether attitude changes persisted and spread to others in voter social networks. The results measured by an unrelated panel survey showed that both gay and straight canvassers produced large effects initially, but only gay canvassers' effects produced in three weeks, six-week, and nine-month follow-ups. We also find strong evidence of within household transmission of opinion change, but only in the wake of conversations with gay canvassers. Contact with gay canvassers further caused substantial change in the ratings of gay men and lesbians more generally. These large, persistent, and contagious effects were confirmed by a follow-up experiment. Contact with minorities coupled with discussion of issues pertinent to them is capable of producing a cascade of opinion change. And uh, the body of the text starts, foremost among theories of prejudice reduction, is the contact hypothesis, which contends that outgroups' hostility diminishes when people from different groups interact with one another. Of course, I suppose that depends on what the interaction is. Um, although contact is credited with reducing prejudice towards a wide array of outgroups, in practice it is often difficult to facilitate intergroup contact of sufficient duration to dispel negative stereotypes and build empathy. For this reason, research attention has recently focused on alternative interventions that may be deployed in a more compressed time frame. Examples include brief personal contact with outgroup members during the course of a conversation and the extended contact that occurs when one learns that a close friend has experienced positive contact with an outgroup. The question is whether brief or indirect contact is sufficient to produce meaningful and enduring attitude change. Recent literature reviews have been tentative on this point, noting the lack of randomized experiments that track attitudes months after the intervention. So these guys are going to do their own, and uh, I'm skipping over their theoretical contribution and moving to the empirical one. Our empirical contribution is the first field-based experimental demonstration of persistent attitude changes in wake of active contact. The effects were substantially large among those who received the messages directly, and these are effects diffused to other members of the receiver's household. Both direct and secondhand effects were estimated with a high degree of statistical precision, and findings were confirmed in a follow-up experiment. Experimental design overview. Registered voters who had previously been enrolled in an internet panel survey were contacted at their doorstep by canvassers. Random assignment determined whether contact was initiated by a gay or a straight canvasser and whether the canvasser discussed the subject of same-sex marriage or recycling, which was a kind of a placebo or a control discussion. Outcomes were assessed unobtrusively by online surveys conducted days, weeks, and months afterwards. 
Participants, participants in the study were Southern California residents who, one, are registered to vote in precincts that supported a ballot measure banning same-sex marriage in 2008. In case you didn't know it, if you registered to vote, your um, registration is public document. Uh, reside at the same address as at least one other registered voter and live in neighborhoods composed of detached dwellings, that is, single-family homes. They're not going to apartments. Using the publicly available California voter file as our sampling frame, we first recruited voters meeting the above criteria to participate in an online survey panel about politics. And I'm not going to read the entire piece because that would take too long. But that's, uh, that gives you a flavor of what they're doing. Random assignment, households in which at least two registered voters were completed, uh, pardon me, completed the first wave of the online panel survey in 2013, were randomly assigned to five experimental conditions. Simple random assignment occurred at the household level to facilitate the analysis of within household spillovers. The first group was assigned to receive the same-sex marriage script from a gay canvasser. The second group was assigned to receive the same-sex same marriage script from a straight canvasser. Groups three and four were encouraged to recycle household waste by gays or straight canvassers, respectively. However, canvassers did not reveal their sexual orientation when delivering the recycling script. The fifth group was a control group to which no canvassers were assigned. Pretty decent um, uh, research proposal. Canvassers in contact. Canvassers were recruited and trained by the Los Angeles LGBT Center, our non-governor a non-governmental organization partner. When approaching each targeted address, canvassers were instructed to, one, administer the assigned script to the first voter who answered the door, two, speak to only one voter per household, and three, confirm his or her name, so they knew who they were dealing with, and so on. Canvassers were coached to be polite and respectful at all times, to listen attentively to voters when discussing either same-sex marriage or recycling, and to refrain from arguing with voters. Maybe Christian canvassers could uh, take a hint from that. <laughs> um, talking points for the same-sex marriage and recycling scripts are presented in figure S1. We'll see that in a minute. The same-sex marriage script invited voters to share their experiences with marriage. This script was the same for gay and straight canvassers with one important exception. Um, wait a minute, I guess we won't see figure S1, but uh, you can find it in the article. Uh, after establishing rapport with the voter, midway through the conversation, gay canvassers revealed that they are gay or lesbian and that they would like to get married, but the law prohibits same-sex marriage. Straight canvassers instead described how their child, friend, or relative would like to get married, but that the law prohibits same-sex marriage. Basically the same problem, only one's personal. Uh, voters were asked to share their shots, uh, thoughts on this dilemma. These doorstep conversation lasted on average 22 minutes. Well, they hit their target pretty well, sounds like. Before outcome measurement, before canvassers went into the field, the study first gathered baseline positions on a range of political attitudes for all participants using an ostensibly unrelated online survey. The survey included 50 questions as described in the supplementary materials. The two questions containing the same-sex marriage and feelings about gay people were buried amid a large number of items on unrelated topics so that the respondents would not suspect any connection between the survey and the canvassing visit. So they're trying to not let anybody know that they're actually doing the study. They're just, it sounds like normal stuff going on. Uh, verifying design assumptions and identifying causal effects in 11 cases Canvassers were told to go away before completing their script. We code these attempts as successful contacts for the purpose of conservatively estimating the average treatment effect among door answerers, as explained in supplementary materials. So that's what happened to the people that they didn't even get to first base with. Well, um, results, direct effect of con conversations with canvassers, tracing direct opinion changes over time, spillover effects, and what you really want to see is the figure. And you will notice that if you look at the figure, um, the initial change was quite considerable. But as time went on, 
The straight people lost their influence. The gay people kept theirs, but only when talking about gay marriage, not when talking about uh, recycling or something like that. In fact, there was a slight difference between gay and straight um, uh, people on uh, attitudes uh, 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 talking about recycling, but over time that was obliterated. And maybe there's a little residual difference about straight people talking about gay marriage. Um, but what's even more interesting is this is secondhand contact, and notice that secondhand contact made quite a bit of difference at three days, 12, let's see, 12 days, 23, 27 days. This is when the Supreme Court decision came down to decide um, uh, that, in fact, uh, the California statute was unconstitutional according to the Supreme Court. Now, what I find fascinating is that the court decision seems to have happened the same time for everybody. So we had all of these people doing these surveys at the, on the same date, it sounds like. Um, which is interesting. It may become important later on, who knows. Um, now this is a temperature thermometer and you'll, you'll notice that for direct contact there's more favorable and less uh, whatever and less slightly unfavorable opinions in the red group, the, the ones that were contacted by the gay canvasser and the, compared to the recycling script. And uh, that's true of the secondhand context, although not quite as much. And you can see there's been a shift according to the story. Um, uh, if we have a question? Yeah, how do you determine that temperature? <laughs> is uh, that, is it's that apparently subjective? a 100 degree thermometer. What do you think about gaze? Zero to 100. What's the temperature? A follow-up experiment to verify key findings. In August of 2013, we conducted a second study to verify the three key findings from study one. Large, persistent, and contagious effects of conversations with gay canvassers discussing same-sex marriage. All three findings were confirmed with similar size p-values of less than 0.001, as described in tables S10 to S13. Further evidence suggesting causal mechanism now that they're said this is what it showed, they're going to go over what the, how you explain this. Only gay canvassers produced large and statistically significant secondhand effects on the housemates of those who came to the door. It may be that a conversation with a gay canvasser about same-sex marriage was more likely to be recounted to a housemate. Or it may be that the attitude changed by, the, about by gay canvassers was more deeply felt by voters who participated in the conversation which in turn made them more effective spokespersons for their newfound view. Now, I'm going to stop there and ask how many of you are convinced? Well, let me turn to the last page of the, uh, of the paper that I was able to get. Um, <clears throat> Editorial Expression of Concern. In the 12 December 2014 issue of Science published the report When Contact Changes Minds, an experiment on transmission of support for a gay equality by Michael LeCour and Donald P. Green. On the 19th of May, author Green requested that science retract the paper because of the unavailability of raw data and other regularities that have emerged in the published paper. Science is urgently working toward the appropriate resolution while concerning that a, a fair process is followed. In the meantime, science is publishing this editorial expression of concern to alert our readers to the fact that serious questions have been raised about the validity of the findings in the liqueur and green paper. Marcia McNutt, Editor-in-Chief. Hmm. Now how many are convinced? Um, that... Uh, that, uh, that uh, gay people knocking on doors is uh, an extremely good way to 
spread the uh, and is demonstrably the best way to to spread the idea that gay marriage is a good idea. Oh well, the paper does show a positive effect. Here's the problem. As um, outlined by NewYorkMagazine.com, an interview with Donald Green, this is the co-author of the faked, faked gay marriage study. Well, it's not much, uh, you know, in, as con in contrast to the expression of concern that we just read, this is pretty, uh, this is more than concern, I think. I didn't know that I, ha I don't know that I have anything particularly <coughs> deep or profound to say, Donald P. Green tells me when he, I get him on the phone. Maybe because I'm just very close to this, I'm sort of in a state of bewilderment. It's an understandable reaction given what has happened to the Columbia University political scientists since the weekend. Uh, Green co-authored an extremely impressive science study released in December showing not only that a short conversation with a gay canvasser appeared to significantly nudge California voters in a pro-gay marriage direction, but that the effects were contagious within those voters' households and lasted at least nine months, the final point at which the researchers checked in with the par study participants via online surveys. Within the world of psychological and political science research on attitude change, which more commonly involves small-scale interventions that occur in labs rather than real-life settings, effects of this size and durability are almost unprecedented. If you've ever done door-to-door uh, -door work as a call porter or something like that, you understand why this might be stretching it just a bit. Um, as a result of the study's exciting findings, a wave of publicity followed. The New York Times and countless other outlets, including Science of Us, covered the study, and it garnered an entire This American Life segment. Incidentally, the, the reporter who is giving this story herself made a comment on it as well, as we'll note in, in passing here. As it turned out, the study's too-good-to-be-true results were exactly that. While the canvassing did occur, there may not have been any survey data collected from California voters at all. Following an investigation by David Brookman and Joshua Calla, two graduate students at UC Berkeley, looking to extend the findings, it became clear that Michael LaCour, a graduate student at UCLA and the study's first author, had simply faked the data. When Brookman and Calla noticed discrepancies in contact of the sur survey firm LaCour pointed them to, the firm told them it had never worked with LaCour at all. Brookman and Kala posted their full accounting here, and we're going to look at that briefly as well. We won't read the whole thing, obviously. It's eye-glazing in parts. Um, the grad students notified Green, who quickly became convinced that something was seriously missed with the paper. Just days later, he sent Science a letter asking that it be retracted. Last week at this time, life was relatively normal, he said. We had an interesting hypothesis and a sound research design and robust findings. And now we have the first two, but not the third. The whole research agenda now pivots because things we thought were true, things I thought were true, are backing down, he went on. So I need to just kind of readjust my thinking. In an interview, Green explained what this academic scandal means for the broader practice of social science. Why well, he's more confused about LaCour than angry at him, although I'll admit that, uh, omit that part, but it's available online for free. Uh, and why so many people fell for LaCour's data collection fable. In the immediate wake of the news, this is um, uh, the person writing it, um, that the data were faked. I've seen a lot of people cite this study as an example of problems of the peer review system or even the broader scientific method. What do you think about this argument? The question of what, th this, what does this mean about the integrity of science or the integrity of scientific vetting procedures I suppose you could look at it one of two ways. The negative way to look at it is here was a failure of the review process or a failure of the vetting process or a failure in my part as a senior author. We posted our data, we did all kinds of checks and still fraud slipped through. That's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it is it was because of the po posting of replication data stats and because of the meticulous way in which the study was described that others who sought to do a study like the original studies like Michael LeCour had done tried and failed, 
and ask questions and got answers from the data and recognized that things were out of sync with what had been reported in the article. And so from that standpoint, it's a positive story about the self-correcting nature of science. And the interviewer asked, but you can understand why a lot of people aren't interpreting that way, that they think that the fact that he was able to fool so many people is a pretty big indictment of the process itself. And uh, uh, Green replies, I think it's absolutely correct to say that in the short run, the pro process has its vulnerabilities. And one of the things I am certainly reflecting on now is how can something positive come out of this in terms of the way in which we structure our proceedings in our research, our procedures in our research group. Maybe the answer is that we need to have at least two people at all times gathering primary data. Maybe that was the source of this problem. Uh, what was, the, was the personnel structure here where he was the only guy doing the primary data collection at all unusual? No, it's not that unusual. On the one hand, there's obviously the potential for abuse in that sort of situation. On the other hand, in any professional setting, if we didn't have certain baseline assumptions that our colleagues are acting honestly or not making stuff up, not making stuff, I'm sure it was supposed to be making up stuff or making stuff up, everything would grind to a halt. There's no way not to have some degree of trust baked into the research process, right? I agree. I think that uh, one wants to be skeptical and build in checks, but without some degree of trust, one would have to build in so many checks and so much redundancy into the system that nothing would be feasible except at very high cost. So there's a cost of ratcheting up the level of mistrust, which this study is probably going to do. It's hard for me to say, it remains to be seen, but certainly as I go forward, I want to think about ways in which checks are put into place. The reason you want people to have people do primary data collection alone is that it's the most efficient way to gather a lot of data. You're not having duplication of effort. But if we think fraud is a very real possibility, then duplication is just a necessary cost. What was the span of time between the, when the irregularities were first brought to your attention and when you realized that basically the whole study had fallen apart? Brookman and Kyla brought the concerns they had to my attention last weekend, and they brought aboard Peter Aronow to investigate further. During the weekend, they showed me a preliminary draft of their paper, and it was pretty convincing. Not just pretty convincing, it, I should say quite convincing. I brought it to the attention of LeCour's advisor on Sunday, and we basically set in motion a series of investigative steps first thing on Monday morning. LeCour, of course, is, has an advisor for his doctoral committee. Um, we had a list of five things we wanted to cover, though we really only got to the first two because it was over then. So it sounds like basically with, uh, within basically four days, you went from first finding out about this to sending the retraction request to science. Yeah, on Tuesday I talked to Michael LaCour, trying to get him to admit that the data were fabricated, but he resisted that, and as far as I know, he's still maintaining the data are real. He indicated to me that he was considering writing a retraction. I waited for it on Tuesday, and when it didn't arrive by Tuesday night, I just sent out my retraction. This, by the way, is this last Tuesday, as far as I can tell. Uh, <coughs> I couldn't help but think about confirmation bias as I went back to look at my own reporting on the study. This is our uh, reporter. Because the stuff the study said that you will have more luck appealing to people on an emotional level, tying their own values to the issue in question, most of those basic findings aren't really in question. That's what political science and political psychology have known for a while, right? And his reply, Yes, I think that's what's at issue in this experiment is not whether it's possible to use those elemental psychological forces to change minds, but ra rather whether you can do so in the context of a conversation like this one with messengers like these and have the effect endure and ramify throughout the household. That's what makes the study interesting. Everybody knows that there's some degree of truth in these propositions, and the reason you do an experiment is because is you want to measure the quantity. Now... I'm going to switch at this point to uh, the uh, Brockman, uh, Brook, Brookman, excuse me, Kala and Arano uh, paper, Irregularities in Liqueur, which is posted online and which is also available free. And uh, there's the authors and uh, the date was put up as May 19. Timeline of disclosure. <coughs> This is, they're reviewing, and I, uh, I'm skipping down a little bit. 
Uh, again, if I read the whole thing, uh, we wouldn't have time. Um, January through April 2015, Brookman and Kala were impressed by liqueur and green and wanted to extend the article's methodological and substantive discoveries. We began to plan an extension. We sought to form our priors around several des design parameters based on the patterns in the original data on which the paper was based. Well, I want you to notice that the people who are making this um, who are doing this paper are not prejudiced against either gays in general or gay marriage in particular or even the, um, the conclusions that were reached in the paper. They actually liked it and they were going to try to replicate it and then extend it. As we examined the study's data in planning our own studies, two features surprised us. Voters' survey responses exhibited much higher test re re retest reliabilities than we'd observed in any other panel survey data. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, the response and re-interview rates of the panel survey were significantly higher than we expected. We um, set aside our doubts about the study and awaited the launch of our pilot extension to see if we could manage the same parameters. Liqueur and Green were both responsive to requests for advice about detail, design details when queried. In May 6, 2015, Brookman and Calla launched a pilot of the extension study. May 15, 2015, our initial questions about the data set arose as followed. The response rate of the pilot study was notably lower than what Liqueur and Green reported. How did you get all those people to respond? Well... Hoping we could harness the same procedures that produced the original study's high reported response rate, we attempted to contact the survey firm we believed had performed the initial study and asked to speak to the staffer at the firm who we believed helpful, pardon me, helped perform study one in liqueur and green. The survey firm claimed they had no familiarity with the project and that they had never had an employee with the name of the staffer we were asking for. Oops. The firm also denied having the capabilities to perform many aspects of the recruitment procedures described in liqueur and green. May 15, Brookman and Calla returned the data, returned to the data and uncovered irregulars three, four, five, and six below and described the findings to Green. Green expresses concern and suggests that several avenues of further investigation, one of which led to discovery of irregularity seven. May 16, to ensure we were correctly implementing one of Green's suggestions, Brookman and Kala asked Erno, who, by the way, has co-authored a paper with uh, Lacour in the past, to help confirm and expand the data analysis. Oh, I guess it says that all down here. Erno has statistical experience in the field and has co-authored a working paper that included data from Lacour. May 16, this is the next day, Bro Brookman suspects the CCAP data may form the source distribution and Cala finds the CCAP data in the AJPS replication archive for an unrelated paper. Irregularities 1 and 8 emerge. May 16, continuing, Brookman, Cala, and Aronaw discuss irregularities 1, 7, and 8 to Green. Green requests this report and the associated replication files. May 16, <coughs> continuing, Arano discovers irregularity number two, and so forth. I'm going to skip on down and just to give you a flavor of the irregularities, here's irregularity one and two. One, the article claims that both studies were drawn from two distinct, non-random snowball samples of voters in Los Angeles County, California. However, the distribution of the gay feeling thermometer in both studies is identical to the same feeling thermometer in a national survey data set to which the author had access and which very few other people had. However, it differs strongly from a variety of reference distributions of this item from other data sets. Why did it pick that one? Two. 
The joint distributions of the feeling thermometer and the same-sex marriage policy item are identical in the two studies, despite the fact that they are allegedly drawn from two, random, two distinct non-random snowball samples. And that gives you a little bit of a flavor of the kinds of things they're finding. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to switch to a group that calls itself Retraction Watch. Basically, it's looking for scientific retractions and reasons for them and commenting on them, publishing them, and hopefully um, getting peer review to be more effective. <coughs> Um, I'm skipping down their uh, place, um, although as you notice, the, um, they do have a website and it is open to the public as well. Uh, according to his website, LaCour will become an assistant professor at Princeton University in July. Uh, update as of 8 a.m. Eastern on 5-2015, that mention has been removed from his site, but it is still available on the Google Catch version. And one of the comments noted that it's still available on uh, Princeton University, although we'll see more comments about that. We've contacted him for comment and we'll update with anything we learn. Uh, update 10.30 a.m. of the same article. Brookman tells Retraction Watch he agrees that this was remarkably swift and transparent. And he says, I think there's a couple of reasons why. First, the study's findings had huge implications for people who are trying to advance the cause of equality and have changed how advocates do their work. Every minute we knew the truth and did not disclose it really was a lie by omission to the advocates out there. There was some element of time sensitiveness. Second, the nature of the claims made in the article about the scope of the study, the survey scale, its funding, the number of bills that would have had to been incurred to pay for it, etc., meant that we expected it would have been straightforward to produce at least one piece of evidence that something among these many claims occurred that would inject a shred of doubt into the suspicions. I would guess that Don realized that if not one such piece of evidence could be mustered after 48 hours, it was very unlikely that anything satisfactory was going to ultimately materialize. When you can't find any traces of who funded it or why or how, especially when it's been acknowledged that it's been funded, then you begin to wonder. Update 2 p.m. Eastern. <clears throat> this post-popularity crashed our servers and we have now upgraded. Apologies for the interruption. In the meantime, we've heard from Science, who has sent this comment from the editor-in-chief, Marcy McNutt, noting that the journal will be posting an expression of concern, which we read earlier. Uh, thank you for your query about the possible retraction of the study when contact changes minds. Published in Science, Science takes this a case extremely seriously and will strive to correct the scientific literature as quickly as possible. And uh, there's more to what she had to say. I'm going to skip. We also heard from Princeton. A spokesperson tells us, as you've noted, as you've correctly noted, at this time the individual is not a Princeton University employee. We will review all available information and determine next steps. That doesn't sound good for somebody's employment, does it? And LeCour tells us, I'm gathering evidence and relevant information so I can provide a single comprehensive response. I will do so at my earliest opportunity. And by the way, his deadline was yesterday, and he made his deadline, and we'll get into that. Um, in the comments to the blog, it was interesting, sorry to muckrake, but I have, a few, have had a few tedious days trying to teach a student how to collect meaningful raw data, and reading this has really put me in an angry mood. Apparently, this paper won the 2015 Pi Sigma Alpha Award for Best Paper, presented at the Midwest Political Science Association National Conference. I gathered this information from LaCour's CV on his website and from his Twitter account. Will this award now be returned or rescinded? Um, <clears throat> I attempted to confirm that, and um, the 2015 Pi Sigma Alpha awards uh, were not available on the internet uh, where I looked, at least. Um, Red State, who of course has a different take on it than uh, some of the other commentators, um, posted uh, the uh, uh, 
following. Let's go back to October 18, uh, October 8, 2014, when Planned Parenthood adopted this tactic. Smarting from defeats in state legislatures across the nation and seeing the public support for infanticide slipping, Planned Parenthood has come up with a great idea. They will send door-to-door -door canvassers to convince people that abortion is a good thing. What makes this canvas different from any previous efforts is that the canvassers will be women who have had abortions. You can see where they got that idea. Well, actually, uh, we know where they got that idea. The workshops training these Willie Lomans of infanticide was overseen by Michael LaCour. There is certain rich irony when one contemplates a room full of abortion activists being gaslighted by a fellow leftist into making epic uh, of themselves while engaging in research fraud. In fact, he used the results of this goat rope as a springboard for another paper from his CV, and I've retyped it, um, Selected projects in preparation. Abortion projects received, accepted, retained, and transmitted. Evidence from field experiments from network populations. Experimental design, registration, and pre-analysis plan. So he was planning to go from paper to paper, I guess. Uh, now, the response has been up as of last night. Um, I don't know, it may have been up earlier yesterday, but... Uh, that's when I saw it. <coughs> and he said in a, in a critique, this is, basically, um, this is basically an abstract here that I'll just read the abstract in a little piece of some of the rest of the uh, response. In a critique of LaCour and Green, 2014, David Brockman and Joshua Kalla and Peter Arnau posted a paper online. In this essay, in, in, I introduce evidence uncovering discrepancies between the timeline events presented in Brookman et al. and the actual timeline of events and disclosure. I argue that Brookman et al.'s failure to replicate liqueur in green is likely the result of a failure to follow the respondent-driven sampling procedure in liqueur in green. Uh, they just didn't do it right because they didn't <coughs> do what I told them. However, the failure of Brookman et al. to describe the sampling procedures utilized in their re replicative efforts makes it impossible to evaluate the study's scientific merit, and this has no bearing on liqueur and green. They didn't tell us how they did it, so they must have done it wrong. They had to do it wrong. Trust me, they did it wrong. I, saw, I show that the results presented in Lacour and Green withstand criticism from Brookman et al. So he is not backing down. Most problematic for the claim that the data in Lacour and Green are statistically indistinguishable from CCAP data is the fact that Brookman et al. selected this, the incorrect variable from CCAP. They then further manipulate this variable to make the distribution look more like that in Lacour and Green. When the correct variable is used, the distributions between the CCAP thermometer and the Curran Green thermometer are statistically distinguishable. They don't really match. Selecting the incorrect variable may have been an oversight, but further manipulating the variable to make the distribution look more like liqueur and green is a curious and possibly intentional, quote, error, end quote. Brookman et al. also noticeably omit the primary analysis reported in the main text of Liqueur and Green, which challenges their hypothesis, the within-person correlation between the baseline wave and the nine-month follow-up. I'm not sure how that helps the defense, but whatever. Uh, finally, a replication experiment that does not rely on surveys conducted independently of the parties involved reproduces the main findings reported in liqueur and green. So there's somebody else that did a study and they matched our results, so therefore they're good. They're replicable. And then further on down in the paper, you're wondering, well, why don't we just look at the original data? Well, it's very simple. On May 19, 2015, I was asked to provide the raw survey data that Professor Green ostensibly claimed to have personally checked on July 17, 2014. Actually, he claimed not to have checked it, but that's okay. I refused to furnish this information because the data reported in Liqueur and Green were destroyed due to privacy confidentiality requirements as stated above. And if you're wondering why, it's IRB made me do it. 
You see, these people may have given their sexual orientation, among other things, and so we could not have that data si sitting around. So basically, I fed the dog my homework because I was required to by the IRB. Um, <coughs> and there is now, I discovered, just before he made his comments and not reacted to in that way, um, re uh, a note on Retraction Watch that says, Science Retracts Troubled Gay Canvassing st um, Study Against Lacour's Objections. So Science Retracted has, not, they've not just done an expression of concern, they flat out retracted it now. Following revelations of data issues and other problems, which crashed our server last week, Science is retracting a paper claiming that short conversations could change people's minds on same-sex marriage. The co-author who admitted to faking the data does not agree to the retraction. Wait a minute. Who admitted to faking the data? Well, he doesn't actually. He just, um, he just says that some of the things that I said were true were not true, but trust me on the rest of it. Um, according to science, here's more from the note. Science, with the concurrence of Dr. Donald P. Green, is retracting the 12 December 2014 Report when contact changes minds an experiment on transmission of support for gay equality by Lacour and Green The reasons for retracting the paper are as follows one survey incentives were misrepresented To encourage participation in the survey respondents were claimed to have been given cash payments to enroll to refer family and friends and to complete multiple surveys in correspondence received from Michael Lacour's attorney He's lawyered up now. He confirmed that no such payments were made. The statement on sponsorship, too, the statement on sponsorship was false. In the report, Lacour acknowledged the funding from the Williams Institute, the Ford Foundation, and the Evelyn and Walter Haas Jr. Fund. Per correspondence from Lacour's attorney, this isn't just from them, this is from Lacour to his attorney. This statement was not true. Well, I lied about that, and I lied about that, but please trust me on the rest of it. In addition to these known problems, independent researchers have noted certain statistical irregularities in the responses. Le two, LeCour has not produced the original survey data from which someone else could independently confirm the validity of the, report, of the reported findings. Uh, Michael LeCour does not agree to this retraction. That's part of the statement. As LeCour told us last week, he told Science Insider he plans to reveal his side of the story shortly. In the email exchange yesterday with Science Insider, LeCour promised to provide a full report in his defense. LeCour said he's doing his best to finish as quickly as possible, and we have seen that. Now, if I'm trying to summarize this, uh, probably the best way I can say it appears that LeCour is still saying, trust me, and uh, if his attorney is correct, he's saying, trust me, even though I lied about some things, which is kind of a little hard for me to buy. Um, if this research is fraudulent, it does not mean that gay marriage is not a good idea. That would have to be determined on independent grounds. It does not even mean that the most effective way to spread acceptance of gay marriage is not to have gay gays talk about it to acquaintances. What it does mean is that fraud can happen and if the results of scientific research are unbelievable one is not obligated to unquestioningly accept them. This is particularly true in a politically or religiously charged environment. It also means that peer review is not a guarantee of scientific accuracy. It's only a guarantee of scientific orthodoxy, if you want to put it that way. Uh, science is much more messy than is sometimes portrayed. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Questions, comments? Yes? 
Um, it, it should be coming on shortly. Testing. There we go. Uh, I'm encouraged uh, with the uh, robustness of the correction that seems like is, is in the scientific process. It seems as though there was people that took this very seriously and sort of got to the bottom of it in a timely manner. Yes. Um, I think that uh, the scientific community in general has kind of popular beliefs as well as scientific uh, data that they look at. Uh, and that influences how people look at things. But I think that there is a substantial core of scientists that realize that if they lose the point of reproducibility, if they lose the point of honesty, uh, that they're no better than any other postmodern group. And that they feel very strongly that we need to keep this thing all on the up and up. And even though this is technically not usually what you consider science, it is in a way because it is a study that's supposed to be reproducible. And because it's reproducible, it's supposed to be generalizable. In other words, you're supposed to be able to take this study and say, oh, now we know how to change minds, send people who are personally involved. <coughs> and, and in that sense, I can't really fault them too much. I, you know, I think that uh, Christianity is probably best, uh, best spread by people who have actually had some experience in it. <laughs> um, a <coughs> couple more things. Uh, I mean, how practical is it to say, hey, if you publish a paper, you need to make the data available by default? Is that practical? That gets into a really sticky problem. Um, and, I'll, and I'll say this as a person who's actually done a study who had one investigator myself in, uh, look at the data uh, or look at certain parts of the data, didn't do the whole thing. I was <laughs> completely blinded to the other side of the data, uh, except in eight, in 80 instances, and four of those were misleading as well. Um, uh, I think that <coughs> what you don't want is one person to be in control of the data and know which way the data should fit. I think that's one. Uh, uh, and I think that I think that before data are erased, there should be at least two people that look at it. I, I can't you anonymize the data? Can what? Can't you anonymize the data and then make it? available to whoever wants to look at the data? Well, sure you can. I am not sure why this guy promised to, you know, obliterate all the data and not let anybody else see them. Uh, well, unless he wanted to commit fraud and not be able to be discovered. But it, he says he's following uh, requirements or by, by the IRB or whoever in doing that. So I mean is this is that a common thing for IRB to to tell researchers to after you do the study to destroy the data? I Well, I don't really know yeah. that they um, they anonymize the data, I can tell you that and and the links are oftentimes impossible except for certain people to be able to to link them. That that's happened in the Adventist Health study, I know because um, I actually did the, the second Adventist study uh, my uh, one of my research projects was, uh, was to uh, look at senile dementia and diet. And, um, and in that case, the data are pretty well kept. Um, but most of them are s separable from the surveys. And unless you have s certain secret codes, you can't get to the surveys. And that's done for obvious reasons in that case, too. And that is that, you know, we want people to tell the truth about, well, actually, I have ham once in a while. You know, when, uh, uh, if their employer find out about that, why the employer might not be too understanding. I thought you were a good Adventist. So it's kind of, uh, the, the, 
the problems that he's dealing with are real. Uh, the truth of the matter is that I don't know that this thing can be solved by appropriate rules because all you really have to do if you want to continue this process is you just have two people that agree to make up the data and then you can still make it up. What you really need is honesty. And, and I think that's one of the reasons for uh, what you could call the um, professional death penalty that's meted out to medical students who report um, uh, reflexes on a wooden leg. You know, obviously they're either totally incompetent or, they, uh, or more likely they're totally willing to fudge. And if you have people that are that bad at, di at discernment or people that are that bad at reporting what they actually see, uh, you know, when you get out in practice, there is what they call the power of the chart. And the power of the chart basically says if it wasn't written, it wasn't done. But it also says if it was written, it was done. And so if you looked at the ears and they were red, they were red. And if you looked at the ears and they really had wax in them, but you said they were red, it's very hard for anybody coming after you to say, well, you're wrong. Well, maybe they wax moved in the meantime, you know? Um, and so when people are dishonest, you have to can them. Because there's no room for that kind of stuff. And the fact of the matter is, in science, all of the, all of the careful <coughs> oversight by other people isn't necessarily going to discover when you're doing fraud. And we have people like Dr. John Darcy, who published, I think it was 140 papers, before somebody finally tumbled to the fact he wasn't on the level. And, that his, and then they went back and looked, and sure enough, you know, all of the lab uh, the lab books were either uh, fraudulent or missing. And in fact, although this case had a fairly rapid re resolution, uh, in that case, I remember reading in the New England Journal somebody commenting, some four doctors from India saying, you know, we looked at our um, IHSS patients, I forgot, it's ASH now, I think. Uh, and um, and they, didn't, they didn't behave like John Darcy's. And maybe it was because of, you know, we're looking at different populations, and maybe it's because we're using different criteria, and maybe it's because they had four reasons for it. And the fifth reason wasn't even mentioned that, well, maybe he made it up. The fact of the matter is, Science is built on trust. If you like, science is built on faith. And, uh, and if you have people that are not worthy of faith, you have to get rid of them. There's no two ways about that. <coughs> comment here, comment there, and then comment there. I was intuitively skeptical about this uh, finding that 20 minutes at the door could change a man's uh, attitude. I will confess that I'm totally open-minded and uh, willing to look at new things, but I also noticed that a week or so ago, Ireland was the first country by popular consent to become uh, supportive of gay marriage, and everybody was shocked. And so they said, well, how could Ireland do this, being a good conservative Catholic country? And the explanation given was that the people of Ireland, whose minds have been recently exercised on clerical child abuse and other problems within the Catholic Church, had had enough and now were voting otherwise, perhaps in reaction to that. There's a whole lot of psychology in these things, and it's easy to uh, misread them.
If this study was completely faked, what, what would you think the effect is that he was trying to get by pulling this off? Um, I, I'm having a little hard time thinking about this because there's a lot of lot at stake here because if they found out that it wasn't that it was not true, you know, people could get branded for life. Well, not the least of which is now it looks like Cornell is kind of not sure they want him on their faculty. Uh, pardon me? Princeton. Yeah, you're correct. Princeton. Yeah, uh, I mean, this, this has job ramifications for him. So I agree. It's, why so would you do are that? Are they stupid? <laughs> I mean, what, what is the uh, comment here? And oh. <laughs> well, I think he believed he had a, a high moral cause for doing what he did. And sometimes uh, people will will let the ends justify the means. Well, D Dan Rather comes to mind in that regard. I, I'd throw in another factor here. There's the publish or perish one. And uh, if you can get a good paper out in science, uh, this, is, this is good on your CV. Well, I, you get it into science. How many people have wanted to get papers into science for who knows how long? and not gotten them in. Th this is huge on your resume. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to c comment about the uh, <coughs> situation. I am a little bit surprised, not completely surprised, that science published this because uh, uh, true, uh, you can't tell for sure if, the, if, if he made up the data, but the the guy at Berkeley, uh, what is it, Brookman? Uh -huh. uh, he was able to tell, hey, there's something funny about this paper. Uh, science, which is, you know, arguably the top science journal of the world. Uh, uh, some people would pay, say nature, but yeah, it's in that. Uh, they should have caught that before Brookman did. You'd think if they had it peer reviewed and all that stuff, uh, that, that uh, maybe they should have in their way. I think there's a weakness there. Well, think about it. If you were a peer reviewer and they handed you an article <coughs> like this, would you insist on seeing the raw data? And then if he said, well, we have to keep it confidential because of the uh, IRB at uh, mm -hmm. UCLA, what would, you, would you have stuck to your guns and saying, oh, you know, I'm sorry, this is too important to let... But w was that done? Did science do that? I mean, did they I'm pretty sure they didn't. People yeah. looked at it and <coughs> said, well, the data looks pretty good to me, uh, and <coughs> I don't see any obvious patterns. I, I, mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is science lives on trust. Yes, which brings the, the last point I want to mention. That, uh, that is, uh, I, I pick up here, and you pick it up very often, that, hey, uh, we're great. We're self-correcting. Look, we just corrected something. We're great. And, and I, I appreciate the fact that science is, to a certain extent, self-correcting. However, I would point out that self-correction in science occurs only within accepted paradigms. For instance, you know, uh, uh, spontaneous generation used to be accepted, and then Pasteur came along and threw it out, and then evolution came along and put it back in. Uh, then we have catastrophism. That was accepted, and uh, Lyle came around and rejected it, and then, of course, in the 18, 1960s and so on, we had a reacceptance of this. So is science self-correcting? I sh think we have to be a little more cautious about adopting that viewpoint. Well, let's see. Lyle published in, what, 1830-something, 1850? Who, Lyle? Yeah. 1832. 1832. And we went from 1832 to 1960, so yeah. over a century before that particular thing got, got corrected. Even if you, even if you say that, uh, that Harlan Bretz was the one who got that particular thing straightened out, he, he, uh, we're still talking a century. Well, his views were not accepted until the 60s. 
W well, no, by the, by the time you get to 1940, <coughs> you're starting to see glimmers of acceptance. Bad, yeah. And by the time you get to 1980, I think we're pretty much... <coughs> exactly. I mean, right now, if you go uh, to uh, Dry Falls, you will find a sign that says, and this is what happened, and, and J. Harlan Bretz <coughs> was right, and his critics were wrong. Well, I, I think this incident should... should uh, at least warn us we need to be more careful about what we read in science journals because they're vulnerable like everybody else is to 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 errors and the, their claim superiority uh, applies in certain areas but it doesn't in others not to change the subject but something more important, and that's the criminality in the soccer world and FIFA's problems. What it shows is, is that corruption exists everywhere, greed exists everywhere, <coughs> mankind is um, sinful, and there's very little solution for it. I, I, I would add to that that the, the most discouraging thing to me about this uh, uh, soccer football situation is the fact that we seem to accept dishonesty as okay where is where, where is society headed if we have no more absolutes left well you know it, it <coughs> one of the thing, cases that could be made would be doing a research project and see whether dishonesty is more common among people who believe that there's somebody watching over their shoulder all the time expecting them to behave or whether it's uh, whether it's somebody who believes that there's nobody out there that it doesn't really matter. Um, the problem that I have with that kind of research is who judges uh, when corruption and dishonesty occurs, because uh, because now you have the question of whether the study itself could become corrupted. Well. The so we argue, you know, well, in science, you need to be more careful because somebody's going to repeat your experiment and show that you're wrong. Uh, this is the wrong motive, folks. You have to do, be honest because that is what is true and what is fair and so on, not because you're going to be caught. Um, I agree with you. I think that, I think that there, there has been something lost when the question is, what can you get away with? Um, as, as, as Lincoln famously said, honesty is the best policy, but as some wag said after him, he who is honest because it is the best policy is corrupt already. <laughs> I don't think it's all that difficult to do research and do it in a way that's not honest. If you start out at the beginning of your research knowing what it is you wanted, you're going to find at the end, get Dr. Billionaire to fund it, and you convince your university that because Dr. Billionaire funded it and because you're so wise, then the IRB says, well, it must be wonderful, and now you're set to go. And it, it's a lot easier to do that than it may sound. And IRB committees, as, as important a function as I think they have, they're not going to go out and check every detail of, to see whether this person is honest before they pass his research. Well, as a matter of fact, that's not what our IRBs are, are set up for. I know having sat on an IRB for probably seven or eight years um, and being one of the more active members and the one that they usually handed the tougher cases to, and I have some interesting stories on that, but uh, um, they ask, are you treating the human subjects properly. They do not ask, have you ever cheated? <laughs> they do not ask, um, what protocols do you have to keep the investigators from cheating? That's not their function. Maybe it should be part of it. I've sat on IRB committees for many years as well. And I, and I agree with you. That's not one of the things that the IRB does. But where is there a check and balance along the way that says, this is not going right. Are, are you asking the right questions? Or do you have an agenda? 
here's what you're going to find, and so you set it up so that that's what you find. Well, the answer where, to where the, is that check? The answer to that is very simple. That's supposed to be the function of the advisors. Yeah, but what if you're the advisor? What if you're mm -hmm. faculty? Who's advising you? That's a problem. That's a problem whenever we're dealing with human uh, research is that, you know, who, who watches the store? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the words of, uh, you know, if, if an advisor is there, as uh, I think Al Gore famously said, there's no controlling authority. And if the advisor wants to be crooked, there's very little that anybody can do. Re-elected. There you go. There you go. <coughs> Re-elected. I think we need to keep in mind that the humanness of each one of us and the difficulty one has once one has committed himself to a certain viewpoint and has published about it or may have been embarrassed in public about it and so on, this all makes it more difficult for that person to change his mind, which is not a good thing at all and which we ought to all learn from. And that is to uh, let's watch that our pet theories aren't given special privilege. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there are some institutions that are harder to corrupt than others. I think that's one reason why, in general, democracy is preferred to monarchy. But both of them can be corrupted. Uh, you just have to work harder for one. I think maybe it's harder to corrupt science than it is to corrupt social science. Yes. Because in social science, you're dealing with people and opinions. And, and, and with social science, I can understand why you would destroy the data, because it is so potentially terrible. But with science, um, in the lab, isn't it a little more difficult to corrupt that? Uh, and yet it does happen. And there are several cases that are famous and probably a few more that are not as famous that, that show it happening. We can add that in historical science, you don't have a laboratory to do it and there it's a little more easy to uh, uh, follow a false route than uh, in experimental science. I tend to turn to an authority, and Putin said this FIFA thing is all America's fault. Uh, and speaking of corruption, I think it's, it's very clear that where the zeal is very high, the corruption tends to be high. Uh, because of the importance of the cause. And I think that that behooves us to remember that when in our own work, that we're, if we're very, very zealous for something, we need to be very careful about how we do the studies. And I agree with you, and I think also that if we're talking to somebody who's very, very zealous, that we take it with just a grain of salt until we have a chance to, to verify. Absolutely. Well, uh, come back next week and we'll see if the ferns are still on the agenda. <laughs>